time having arrived, I call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order. Would you all please rise and join with us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on the agenda uh, this evening is a hearing of visitors. We did not have anyone sign in, so we will move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the manner in which the school committee deals with items of routine business. I would ask now if any school committee members have items on the consent agenda that they would like removed and dealt with individually. Mr. Minicello. I just want to make a quick comment about one item on okay. there, and that's the um, scholarship for John C. Thomas. Um, growing up over in the Ashfield area, Mr. Thomas lived over by the Ashfield School, a few streets over. And um, this was a very humble man. You would never have known that he um, had achieved so much in the Olympics. And he certainly never bragged about it. And the reason why I found out about it is I was just coming across a sports book in the library, and I stumbled across his name. And I'm like, this is Antonio's father? And as, as, you know, as you learned more about him, and then I asked him a few questions. This was a great guy, yes. and, and just someone that was a great role model, um, so understated, and um, certainly deserving of the recognition this evening. So um, that being said, just a, a, a wonderful community member, um, and someone that we in the neighborhood, the Asheville neighborhood, looked up to um, as kids. So Very nice. that's my two cents <laughs> worth. Now he was a he was a great community partner. He served the city well, also on the library board of trustees. He was very um, very much a contributor. Uh, I'd entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Is there, is there a second? No, no. Okay, Mr. I'd like to just pull out DNA. Oh, you'd like to Real pull out? Okay. Real quick. All right, then, um, Mr. Minicello, could you. Um, I'll make amend a motion, motion to approve items A, B, C, F, and G. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made. Second. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Mr. Sullivan, um, on items D and E. Just, uh, I'm trying to make it as quick as possible. I wanted to make a, a little notation that a donation was made by the school on wheels. <coughs> it was only a small donation, but it was real nice to have it, which is D. E is a large donation from Columbia Gas Company, which was donated to the Raymond School of $1,000, which we all know they didn't have to do. And they, they're trying to make an effort. And I just wanted to recognize them for that. Okay. And Mr. Sullivan, uh, if I could, when you talk about uh, the $250 donation to Champion High School, and it is to purchase, you know, back passes uh, for student transportation. That's what I meant to mention. And, and it allows them, again, to uh, do after school activities. It allows them to get to and from many of the things that are happening uh, at Champion. And I agree with you when you talk about even uh, Columbia Gas, you know, getting together, supplying backpacks, or just that little bit of money that allows the principal an opportunity to do some special things for, and in this case, the Raymond School. It is very much appreciated, you know, from our uh, business community, um, you know, to really support the children in the schools. Thank you. So, Mr. Sullivan, I'd entertain a motion. I'd make a motion to accept D&E &E as motion. written. Motion has been made to approve. Is there a second? Um, most has been made and probably seconded. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Thank you all. Next on the agenda is the uh, report of the Superintendent of Schools. Well, I'm very pleased tonight. Um, actually, before we begin, uh, I would like to introduce, uh, many of you have, have heard me talk about the uh, superintendent induction program for new superintendents around the state. And as I've mentioned to you, there are actually 22 new superintendents in Massachusetts this year. And our Race to the Top money actually supports uh, an institute for the superintendents for class time. It also provides for a superintendent coach. And 
the superintendent coach actually joins the superintendent in a district this year for about eight hours a month. They come out and they actually watch your practice. They will come to, we just actually attended a PAC meeting at West Middle School um, and, and the school committee meeting tonight. So I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Jim Marini, Dr. Jim Marini, uh, a former superintendent from the Newton Public Schools and uh, he will be with us this evening. So welcome, Dr. Marini. And also, I'm also pleased to introduce to you tonight, every year we have representatives from Brockton High School, student representatives that serve on our school committee. And this year, I'm very, very pleased to introduce you to Jessica Freeborn, who is a sophomore at Brockton High School. She will be supported by Derek Montero, who is a senior at the high school. He will be the alternate. And one of the things we want you to do is to hear that student voice every week. They will be sharing with us going forward initiatives happening at the high school, uh, curriculum events happening at the high school, the science fairs, you know, many of the things that go on in the day-to-day -day lives of our Brockton High students. They'll be supported by staff at the high school. And I told Jessica tonight, we'll let her get used to the forum, the school committee, being a member of the team. But Jess, would you like to say hello? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> very honored. Just to say I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Well, we're thrilled to have you, and we look forward to your being a part of, of our school committee team. So thank you. Um, Mrs. Joyce. Um, I, I must say, this is the first time that we've had a representative that will have a voice. And this is a welcome change from the past. Uh, we're very interested to know what's going on at the high school to get your point of view and the student's point of view, and I think we'll, it will really enrich what we do on the school committee. So we're very interested in what you have to say, and we're really excited about you joining us. So welcome. Thank you. Superintendent. Yeah, and uh, I believe what we would like to do is, um, out of order, I'd like to take um, JROTC presentation by Colonel Robert Tripp. We're very pleased to have Colonel Tripp here for his his last journey, I guess, presenting to us officially. He'll be introducing some new guests to us this evening, our team members. Good evening. I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, so you... <laughs> Before I begin, um, most of the members here uh, know Sergeant Clark, and uh, who's been with me for a year. And uh, the reason I didn't retire last year was to give him a good, a good year uh, with me, so uh, we can uh, that we we had a good continuity as as the program went forward. But I'd like to introduce uh, right off the bat uh, uh, Colonel Robert Pieso, who comes to us from uh, Hawaii. He was last. Uh, he just retired from active duty yesterday, and uh, his last duty assignment was <laughs> Fort Shafter. And uh, but he is a native uh, of the area. He comes from Canton, Massachusetts. I'll go through his uh, biographical information as, as a little bit later. But uh, Mayor Balzotti uh, and Superintendent Smith, I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to come. And, as you say, my last hurrah here. It's been a it's been a great run these last 19 years. But the last time I was invited to speak to the school committee was 1995, one year after the program began, and um, it, it does give me an opportunity to to update the school committee now uh, here, being 2013, as I prepare to leave as to where we've come. Uh, I just I, 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 there seems to be a lot of agenda items, but we're going to keep it we're going to keep it brief. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the mission of Junior ROTC, the history of it, both nationally and here at Brockton High School. A little bit about our curriculum, the prerequisites for our program, and our co-curricular activities. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about service activities we do around the city, although many of you are aware of those already. 
We have a, a summer camp we call our uh, JROTC Cadet Leadership Challenge. Uh, every year, uh, usually in May, we come to you and you vote on uh, whether or not we can go, and fortunately you've always said yes. Uh, we'll talk about uh, JROTC instructors, how um, our salaries are calculated, JROTC budgets uh, for FY13, the current year, um, what are some of our alumni doing now, are, are, what are they're doing now, and we'll talk about the, the uh, transition between uh, myself and Colonel D'Esso. The mission of uh, Army Junior ROTC, and this is a national mission, is to motivate young people to be better citizens. Now, th that's a pretty general statement, and the way I like to look at it, and the way I've looked at it the last several years that I've been here, is to take that word citizen and turn it into citizenship. And basically, what we want our kids to come away from with is, a, is what the responsibilities of citizenship is all about. We recognize that there are a lot of students in the school and a lot of students in my program that are not U.S. citizens. But I think they all understand that uh, there is, has to be some loyalty to where they live and some giving back to that community, uh, that they are a part of that community and they have contributions to make. And, and that's how I see that mission and that's how I usually tackle it. Um, talk a little bit about the history of the program. Uh, this picture here, it's interesting. Uh, JROTC is a national program. didn't start till 1916 uh, during the World War I period. Uh, but there have been uh, cadet corps in schools around the country for many, many years before that. This is actually a picture provided to me by the Brockton Historical Society of the Brockton High School JROTC Cadet Corps in 1907. So um, uh, you know, just because we, we restarted the program in 1994, we did have cadets here um, you know, 100 years ago or so. Uh, as I said, the uh, Junior ROTC program officially began with the National Defense Act of 1916. And it was because of the, uh, the proximity to World War I and the world situation at that time that as initially it was intended to prepare young men for military service. Uh, it's now a leadership character development program open to both men and women, uh, and there's no military obligation associated with it. Uh, it came to Brockton High School during a national JROTC expansion program that uh, began in, in 1994, 1995 school year. We started with 88 cadets that year, and now we're approaching 100, 270. Uh, uh, right now, uh, if you look at Infinite Campus, that's what it's telling us. So. Um, I know this is a busy slide, but it, 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 if you just take a minute to look at uh, some of the items that we cover in our curriculum, uh, I won't read them off. Um, there's a couple things I might make uh, a point of. Uh, it, with Junior ROTC, one physical education course can be waived. That, uh, the state allows us to do that. Um, a lot of the... Uh, uh, a lot of these things are required. Some of them are elective, uh, depending on the time that we we spend uh, with the kids in lessons. The problem is they we get going on one aspect of the course, and I'm sure this is true of a lot of courses at Brockton High. Um, you get their interest in one area, and it takes a little bit longer to go through that area than you had planned. Um, but um, they do take a lot away from that. Um, our program is presented in up to four years of leadership education and training courses. The name of the program is Junior ROTC, but the name of our courses are Leadership Education and Training. Uh, they're, div they're divided into eight separate semester courses. Let, of course, is the acronym for Leadership Education and Training. 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, and 4A and 4B. Each course uh, uh, provides one and a half uh, elective credits toward graduation. Prerequisites, um, some of this comes out of Army regulation, but they must be medically and physically able to take gym classes at Brockton High because there is a physical component to our program. They must pass the previous junior ROTC class with a, a grade of C minus or higher, uh, B minus for uh, uh, let three Bs moving into uh, let four A, the fourth year of the program. And the reason for that is it is a leadership development program. If you're getting a C minus in junior ROTC, you're barely meeting the requirement of leadership. And uh, as our cadets uh, go through the program and as they advance through each of these courses, they are expected to demonstrate more leadership and to take on more responsibility for leadership. We are organized as a military unit um, it's not the only way to teach leadership, but that's the way we know how to do it. And um, the cadets actually do run the cadet battalion. 
you know, we're there as advisors and teachers and instructors, but we have a, a senior who is the cadet battalion commander. I'm not the commander of the pro program. I, there's a senior in the program that does that. And uh, we have uh, all the leadership positions within the organization are, are held by our students. Uh, we have a, um, a document called the Rules for Success uh, that tells our students, it's about a three or four page document, what is expected of them, including the wear of the uni uniform once, e once each week. I tell them that you know when the uh, Boston Red Sox show up at Fenway Park for a game, they're wearing their uniforms. When uh, the uh, New England Patriots show up at Gillette Stadium for a game, they're wearing their uniforms. And the reason is it's a team identity. And we are a team, and the JROTC uniform identifies them as part of that team. Our co-curricular activities, and this is what keeps a lot of the kids interested in the program, is our award-winning uh, drill team, color guard, our Raider team, let me explain that, that's a military skills physical fitness uh, team. Uh, most of the activities there are uh, competitions that we uh, we have with other schools in Massachusetts that have Army Junior ROTC in the uh, winter and uh, sometimes the early spring. Uh, physical fitness more in the winter and then our military skills in the, the springtime. We have an academic team that um, competes against other schools uh, uh, in the uh, in our uh, JROTC league uh, with, uh, with ap against against each other in academics. Uh, one competition might be oriented toward English language arts. Another one might be toward mathematics. Uh, another one toward leadership uh, theory. And uh, we've always done very well. There are there is a national competition coming up. It's an online competition that we compete in every year. That um, the first phase is in November. The second phase is usually in February. Uh, and and um, if you, we always made it to the second phase. The third phase is in Washington D.C. and and New Bedford beat us out by a couple points a couple years ago. And I'm and I, I'm sorry to say that, that that I'm leaving before we could turn that around. But perhaps this year. And we have a command and staff council, and that is a council or a group of our cadet leaders. I mentioned that each of the that each of the leadership positions within the cadet battalion are held by students, and once a week they get together and do their planning and discuss how they uh, if they need to do fundraising or if we have a, a parade coming up or a community service project, they they figure out how they're going to do that, how they're going to tackle that that project or that activity in those meetings. <clears throat> Community service, um, we're known well around the city of Brockton. Uh, primary people see us in our parades, but um, many of you know that we, we help out uh, extensively with almost the whole battalion, the Brockton School Day Special Olympics, uh, the Gilmore Early Childhood Special Olympics over at the Gilmore School. We take a number of kids over there for that about two weeks after the, the big one and, uh, and um, help out with the little kids at the Gilmore. Um, but we do a, a number of other uh, other functions as well. Um, uh, some years we've we've uh, planted the American flags over at the cemeteries uh, for Memorial Day and and activities such as that. And um, uh, people are always calling us and asking us for help. So if we can provide, we will. Um, school service, we do a lot of that for. Um, uh, college fairs, open houses, parent-teacher conferences. Uh, we provide both guides and translators because we have a number of kids, as you might imagine, that that uh, speak Haitian Creole and uh, Cape Verdean Creole. And uh, if a parent comes in, maybe new to the country, and they need to help, and they need to help find their way around the building, you know, our kids can do that and can do the interpretation for them. Uh, we provide color guards for home football games, National Honor Society inductions, um, uh, the Veterans Day um, uh, assembly. Um, uh, we, we do provide and post the colors uh, a number of times during the course of the school year. Um, talk about the JROTC Cadet Leadership Challenge. Uh, that's our summer our annual summer camp. We try to take the top 10% of our cadet corps to that. Um, it's five days in late June. Um, many years it doesn't conflict with the end of school. This last year, because of the, the lousy winter we had, it did. And, and, and fortunately, uh, we were able to take our kids um, in spite of that. It did conflict a little bit with the exam schedule, but we were able to work around that. The, um, the activities are listed there, repelling, marksmanship, aquatics training, leadership reaction course, and we do a military history tour of Lexington and Concord. And we call them in the Army staff rides, <clears throat> whereby you, know, you, you, you go onto a battlefield and you learn what happened there, um, and um, you know, mistakes, 
the good things that happened, the leadership decisions that were made, good and bad. We talk about those. The last three years, uh, it's been interesting. We've had the, the British have a counterpart program called the Cadet Combined Forces. And the, the Brits, um, one of, there's a school um, in Manchester, England, that has sent um, a handful of their cadets over to our JCLC the last three years. And it's been interesting to take them out on the battlefield and, um, or the, uh, the, the military park there in, in Lexington and Concord and discuss the battle with them. Um, it's also been moving to them because, as many of you know, if you've ever been there, there are a number of British graves uh, around both the, the towns of Lexington and Concord. And, um, they lay flowers at, at those graves and they play their version of taps, which is, I think, they're called the last post. And it, it, it means something to the, both our kids and their kids that, and, uh, that they can learn about something, former enemies, that they can come together and learn, learn what happened there. And it's, been, it's been very moving as well as educational for our kids to, to see that. <clears throat> Qualifications for junior ROTC instructors, and we have a new one here tonight. Um, must be retired from active duty, must be certified by the United States Army Cadet Command, and the requirements these days are driven by the No Child Left Behind Act as implemented by agreement between the United States Department of Education and the United States Department of Defense. Uh, JROTC instructors are certified by the Army, but are employers, employees, I'm sorry, of the Brockton Public Schools. Um, we retain our military titles and, and we wear our uniforms because as uh, active duty retirees, we go into a, th a thing called the Retired Reserve, and uh, that allows us to continue as members of the military for the rest of our lives, essentially. Uh, soldiers, if you will, uh, not on active duty. Uh, I am the outgoing senior army instructor, as you know. Colonel Bob Dieso is the incoming one. Um, we, um, some of the duties, I act as the JROTC department head here at the high school. Uh, the Army requires that I also have a secondary additional duty as the Command Supply Discipline Officer because, as you might expect, there are thousands of dollars worth of federal equipment, uh, computers, instructional whiteboards, uh, overhead projectors, things, things, a lot of federal property that needs to be accounted for. So they do require that there be a Command Supply Discipline Officer appointed, and, uh, and I, I am that person. Bob will become that person. I, Okay, and then there's, uh, uh, we also, in order to implement um, uh, the federal budgets for purchasing things, uh, we have a, a government cre credit card and there's some regulations and a lot of paperwork involved in that. I'm the billing official for that. Uh, Master Sergeant Dana Clark is to my left, who uh, is our Army instructor. He has, uh, he is, and a very good instructor, I might add, but he also has additional duties. He's the military property specialist uh, he is the watchful eyes over all the federal property that's been issued to the city of Brockton for the instruction of a junior ROTC here. And he is the government purchase card. He's actually the holder of the credit card for the, for the government property or the government uh, funds. Um, instructor salaries are computed um, based on federal law. Uh, the minimums are governed by um, section tw 2031 primarily of uh, Title 10 United States Code. Um, it's, it's a little clearer if you look at the Army regulation with all that says, sometimes, sometimes the laws are a little bit um, uh, difficult to read. Uh, but it basically says instructors in junior ROTC nationwide must be paid the difference between what they would receive if they had remained on active duty uh, and what, uh, the difference between it and what they receive in their military retirement pensions. And then the good news for Brockton is 50% of that is reimbursed back to the school system. So uh, these norms are incorporated into the contract that was initiated between the Department of the Army and Brockton Public Schools, which was signed in 1994 and updated in the year 2000. Um, this is a, basically our federal budget for FY13. There's a few things that are not listed here. The school system does take out an insurance policy on the federal equipment, and uh, that uh, I, I don't, I'm not involved in that other than reminding them that I need a copy of the, the thing to send on to the Army, and I don't know how much that costs the school system, but uh, um, 
a few incidentals that are not listed here. This is the, these are the major ones. Yes, ma'am. Transportation that seems quite low considering the trips you take in, and uh, how do you sub how do you subsidize that? Because I know okay. that that's not enough. Good for question. You I'm do. glad you asked it. So, you know, it varies from year to year. We've had as much as two thousand dollars, and in some years it's eighteen hundred. This year uh, it's fifteen forty. Um, but when we run out of that. Uh, I go to the United States Army and say, okay, we're out of school money. We've got a bunch of trips left that we need to take for competitions. Help us out. And they, they, they come through. Okay. And I might also add that you will not, the, the, uh, normally I'll have to take that out of that $35,000. Uh, but um, the, when we go to the, our JCLC in the summertime, that's a separate pot of money that is not given to us that they hold at uh, Cadet Command that, uh, and that, that money is already, uh, you know, we don't have to take that out of our budget. That's provided. But yes, yeah, some of the competitions I do have to go in, and I do have to ask for ask for some help. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't I can't arrange I can't arrange for that myself. Well, I do arrange for the transportation, paying for it right. has to come out of their yeah. out of their uh, funding up there. But. And the the funding has to come out of the federal budget. What for transportation? For anything? Uh, it, no, it's a shared program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the instructor the salaries are 50 50. Yeah, okay. Transportation, you know, I, I put in for transportation every year for the school. They, mm -hmm. they give me what they can. And I appreciate that there's a whole lot of other activities around mm -hmm. the school that are looking for transportation from the varsity sports right on down to some of the clubs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for what we get. Right. And this will take us through much of the drill season. Mm -hmm. But when we get into the season, um, the physical fitness competitions and the uh, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, co the military skills competitions, I'll, I'll probably end up having to go to the federal government and get, and get in. But they've never, they never said no, you know, in spite, now they're all shut down, and, you know, sequester and all that stuff, no telling what the spring is going to bring, but we can hope for the best. You know, so. How was that number determined in the first place every year? The school? The, like the 1540, where'd that number come from? That, that comes from what I what I submit to the okay. uh, when they ask when so the, through the normal process of school request. budgeting and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that that takes place um, every year mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and the instructional supplies are the same things right. uh, okay. and we are able to get supplies also from the federal government so the you know I'm I'm able to get some copy paper from them so augment what the school is able to provide to us mm -hmm. so. Um, and so far, you know, I know we're at the bottom of the Department of Defense priority list, but but so far, you know, we've always been able to manage, and um, I try to be a good steward of, of both sides of the house, both the school and the uh, the federal side. So. Oh, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, a little bit about our alumni. We've had six, as many of you know, graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point. And I like to say, and many of you have heard me say this many times before, it crosses the Brockton demographic. Um, you know, we've had, you know, they're all U.S. citizens, but we've had uh, kids from the Haitian community, kids from the Cape Verdean community. We've had males, females. Uh, it, it really does cross the demographic here in the city. And, and I'm particularly proud of that. I, um, I've been to every graduation for all six, and um, the last one being Dan Moriarty, who graduated this past May, and uh, very proud of him. He's now down at Fort Benning learning to command tanks. He's an armor officer in the Army, and, uh, and, and loving it. He just just enjoy it. Now, besides that, though, we've had several other um, um, uh, cadets attend college on ROTC scholarships. Sometimes not right out of high school. Sometimes they'll pick up an ROTC scholarship after they're there. Um, uh, many three-year scholarships. They've they've had to foot the bill for the first year of college, but then had a free ride after that, right. and uh, and that's been good. We've had uh, several besides the six that have graduated from West Point. We've had s several officers uh, commissioned uh, that are alumni of our program, both the Active Army, the National Guard, and the Army Reserve. And I, I, I'd like to point out, so Mr. Bath here tonight, his, two of his sons are alumni of our program, and, uh, and his, his eldest son, Sam, is, uh, is a captain in the Massachusetts National Guard. Um, we've had uh, many enlisted soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines. They, they come back wearing their, wearing their service uniforms, proud. They sometimes speak to our classes, and our, our kids really like that. Um, but uh, junior, junior ROTC, with uh, the recommendation of the senior Army instructor, uh, provides the opportunity to go in service at a higher rank and more pay than the average recruit. 
uh, depending on how many years of the program you've had and the leadership training, they, they value the leadership training that they get here. So you can actually enter the Army as a, as a private pay grade E2 or private first class, you know, one pay grade above the, or two pay grades above the average recruit that goes in. Now, I, the kids come to me with this, and I like to try to convince them rather than to take that opportunity, um, you know, if they've got the wherewithal to go to college, that would give them more, more options when they graduate. They could then become a commissioned officer if they so desire, or they can enter service as an enlisted soldier and still get the advanced rank. But uh, uh, you know, I, I, the higher, as we all know in this business, that you know, the more education you've got, the more opportunities you've got, and that's true in the military service as well. So I, I try to, I try to. I try to move them along that route, um, but we've had several that have gone in right out of high school mm -hmm. and um, and have, have taken advantage of the uh, the the higher rank. Uh, but we've had uh, some of our alumni are in the Brockton Police Force. Uh, now we've got a number of nurses. One of them is an Army nurse. We had a, a young lady that uh, a few years back that uh, took a four-year Army ROTC nursing scholarship, had a free ride to nursing school at Curry, and uh, now an Army nurse down at Fort Benning. We've got people in the banking business. One young lady is now an engineer designing aircraft engines for the Navy. And we have teachers. We have two teachers here in the Brockton School System that are alums from my program, and I'm very proud of them. Both of them teaching foreign language. I don't know the connection there, but. Okay, now I'd like to talk about the gentleman sitting to my left, who you will see from now on attend these meetings when you vote on field trips and things like that. Bob DiEsso, um comes to us. Uh, he's native of Canton, Massachusetts, so he's coming home. As I mentioned, he came. His last assignment, duty assignment, was in Hawaii and Japan before that. So it's. I think he's not only glad to be back in Massachusetts, but be glad to be back in the United States. Um, <clears throat> he has a BS, uh, Bachelor of Science, Political Science from Bridgewater State, Master of Arts in International, Rel uh, International Relations from Webster, uh, Master of Science in Strategic Studies from the Army War College. Uh, just under 30 years in the Army. Uh, most of his career was uh, uh, in the field artillery and uh, uh, his last several years in, as a member of the Adjutant General Corps, which translated means Army Human Resources. Um, he's an, a veteran operation Desert Storm and his instructional experience, come, he was a, a professor of military science at the University of Tennessee Martin um, and, um, and that will serve this program well, I assure you. And um, if the school committee will allow, I, I, I'd just like to have Bob say a few words of, uh, um, tell us how great, how, how good it is to be here in Brockton, right? <laughs> yes, I'd just like to say, uh, Principal Wolder, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it is really nice to be able to come home. I never dreamed of uh, this opportunity. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. The academic side is very important to me. If you sat in the class with the cadets today, I told them that every other class they take is more important to me than junior ROTC. And that that's the way I'm gonna approach it and that's what I want them to do. And just like Bob said, I hope they all go on to uh, more educational opportunities in the future. The Army option or the military option is always gonna be there. And the higher they can go and the more education they can get, the further they can go. Uh, but it is a citizenship program. I'm glad that every single student is there and we'll work very hard to make them better citizens. And if they wanna go with the military option, that's fine. If they don't, then I just want them to be uh, the best that they can be or whatever they choose to do. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank, well, thank you very much. Okay, our transition, which has pretty much culminated, although I'm st still coming in a few days, there's a few loose ends that got to be tied up, and you can imagine after 19 years, I may be off the payroll, but I want to make things as easy for him. He can focus on, on the instruction now, and I'm uh, just finishing up with the last few reports that we got to submit for the beginning to the Army for, at the beginning of the year. Very important reports, I might add, that the federal budget depends on, the number of cadets and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'll be in and out for the next, uh, probably the next week or so, trying to finish those things up. But my last official day on the payroll of the city of Brockton was last Friday, the 27th of September. Uh, Colonel, Colonel Diesso's official day is today, uh, but I will say he spent several days with us last week and um, uh, he's in process with uh, HR. Uh, we've made some several introductions around the city and the school system. Uh, he's, he sat in on several JROTC classes today and earlier and, and as well as some last week. Um, 
and he's learned some of the instructional technology here. Um, you know, we've got, of course, the the uh, our systems, but there's also some army systems that we use for instruction, and uh, so trying to get him familiar with those. And with that, I just uh, that that wraps up my presentation. But if you have any any further questions, I'd be happy to entertain them, or or Bob, or Sergeant Clark. Is any questions, Colonel Tripp? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Minicello. We all appreciate and know the um, great strides that you've made here for our Brockton students, and um, we're going to miss you very much. And we know how generous you've been in terms of what you give the kids and what you've provided to the school system. Um, you'll be you'll be heartfelt missed here in Brockton, but you're as usual always welcome anytime. And well, you'll welcome, see me around welcome aboard, time. Colonel. We, we, you've uh, you, you're taking over a, a great program. Um, Master Sergeant will certainly be a great aid to you, but um, you um, are going to have a, a great experience here with the Brockton Public Schools and our students. We have a very unique student body, and um, you have a nice program uh, to come into. So welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. And I'd just like to say in, in, in conclusion that I do appreciate what this committee has done for our program over the last several years. I, um, obviously, I, I, I compare notes with my counterparts at other schools, particularly those around Massachusetts, and uh, I got the best deal going here. I, I, I really do. In terms of support from this, the school administration, the school committee, the mayor, um, um, just the people of this, this city and the city and the students in the school, whether they're in JROTC or not, they have been extremely supportive of, of my program. And uh, well, I'm extremely grateful for that. It, you know, people say that, that I've made it a success. It hasn't been me. It's been, it's been a cooperative effort of everybody, school committee, teachers, administration, everybody. That's, that's what's made the program what it is. And I, and, and I also like to say we did get, um, did, did get a letter this morning I got an email this morning with an attachment. For the 14th year, uh, Brockton High School Army JROTC has been designated an honor unit with distinction by the United States Army, which is the highest level that a JROTC unit can achieve. So, and again, that's, all of us can take credit for that. Thank you very much. Done, and you're absolutely right. It has been a team effort, and we support the, the JROTC program because of what you've been able to do for our students and for our kids. And it really has been a very positive addition to to what we offer at Brockton High, and, and that's the main reason we support it because we see what it does for our kids, and we appreciate it. And we look forward to working with um, Colonel Diaso. Did I say that right? <laughs> It'll take me a little practice. And uh, thank you so much for everything you've done. And we do look forward to the future of the JR JROTC program in Brockton. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. I appreciate that. On behalf of the Brockton Public Schools and our school committee, we want to thank you for the service to our young people at Brockton High School for propelling them to higher levels of acade academic achievement and also for caring for them as individuals, for being involved with them as people, as students, their families. Are you going to be sorely missed and you are always welcome in the Brockton Public Schools. I want to thank you for your service. Sergeant Major Clark, you'll be a terrific team, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. And as always, we appreciate all your support. And, uh, thank you very much. We're going to go back to the October 1st, uh, 2013 enrollment report, and as luck would have it, of course, tonight is October 1st. So we've been very busy uh, calculating our figures and uh, our presentation tonight. I'll ask Deputy Superintendent John Jerome to uh, join us. 
first thing I have to ask you is to move. <laughs> Okay, how do we end the slideshow? Because that's what we have now. Hmm? Oh, I see it. Uh, I don't see anything anymore. It's one of the reasons. Okay. Just close at the top. Yeah. Just. Now you are down the bottom. Yeah, right there, thank you. This is a very brief. Uh, slideshow. Again, this October 1 report is only re an October 1 report based on the enrollment as of today. This is not the final report that will go to the uh, Department of Ed. This is just something that, you know, we usually present and we usually have a lot of questions about. At the table, you'll all have the uh, long spreadsheet, which you can probably read a little better than what is up here. I'm not going to actually spend a lot of time on this, this slide. I do want to, though, actually talk a little bit about what the total enrollment is, because I think that's what you're more interested in. I think. Let's go. And there it is. 17,295 students. That's our, that is a number that we have uh, of students enrolled in the district right now. It includes all our programs outside districts. If you look at that uh, area that's uh, in blue, those are more or less uh, some of the parts that are not covered in the grid, uh, grid above. And as you can see, it's a, a significant increase. Last year we reported out this time of year about seven, 16,000, I think 650. Uh, what will happen over the next couple of months, uh, we'll, we'll have to have these numbers certified by the Department of Ed. Uh, they will probably come back and cut some of these because that's what happens. Not all these students right now uh, have stayed in Brockton schools. They might have showed up for the first three or four days. Then if they're absent for like four or five days, we make the inquiry at home if they're actually still enrolled in Brockton. What happens is you'll have a conflict. That's how the numbers change. If someone moves to Bridgewater and they do not notify us, we still submit the name as one of our students when we go to the, uh, the state. And what they'll end up doing eventually is someone actually does compare names, uh, student ID numbers, and whatever, wherever the student was actually attending is the school district that will get the uh, allocation for that student. So if you look at this numbers, I, I really just want to talk a little bit about uh, I'm going to concentrate on kindergarten, grade one, grade two, because that's always, you know, the, the area that we have had the most problems lately. Uh, I'm going to just hopefully I'm going to start with kindergarten because this has been a, as of today, these are the numbers enrolled in kindergarten classrooms. Now, when we met, I believe in August, we talked about trying to cap at 23. Uh, we did our best at that number, but what happens, of course, uh, we end up with a lot of appeals. Some of the appeals make the most sense to allow other students to go to the neighborhood schools. That's why some of the schools got up to 25. But if you look at that, they're all pretty close. Uh, the only issue really, we, we do have additional room at the Gilmore Academy. At the Barrett, we have a few more seats. Overall, if we were to cap at 25, we have about 45 additional seats for students coming in this year, which is more than we had last year at 28. When we, when we capped out at 28 last year, we were um, pretty much every school had 28 students. Uh, it was a problem. We didn't have space for it. The whole idea of opening the Barrett School gave us uh, 13 classrooms. We were able to take not only new students in, or students that were new to the, uh, to the city that we didn't know about, we were also able to move some classrooms, cl kindergarten classrooms, out of some of our elementary schools to make more room for additional first grades. So if you look at this, we have 1,472 students attending kindergarten in Brockton right now. And that number is going to hold pretty true. Um, We've, uh, again, over the last five days, we've had very few uh, changes in that number, so we're pretty sure that that's about where we'll be. Now, when you look and you compare that to grade one, is about, you know, 24, 25 students fewer. The issue in this is, of course, this is 
for us, this is a very positive step because these students last year's kindergarten were in classrooms with 27 other students. Now we've got that number into a manageable number. With the exception of the Davis, where we have the 28 students in grade one, we've made significant progress in all schools to reduce class size in grade, in grade one. Uh, what you need to keep in mind here is, right now we have 70 kindergarten classrooms. Next year they have to fold into 68 grade one classrooms. So there will be some adjustments in the numbers if we don't find additional space. But it's a working, a number that we can work with. If you, inc I believe you have, like I said, 68 uh, classrooms. If you had to add 50 students to that, it's probably a, just a little bit under one, it's one student per class. So we could actually keep these number, numbers pretty low. Any question on that? Because that's always been the, the concern. We wanted to make a reduction in grade one as well. Question, we have 13 classrooms at the Barrett Russell right now. We, there was talk about a, having up to 14 classrooms. Right. Is that still a possibility if we need it? Or no, is that space full. used? We, the space is being used, uh, it was a half a room. Uh -huh. So we really didn't feel we could put a full classroom in there. Okay. Uh, we used it for like a community room. Uh, that's where the parents are going to meet. So we, we're pretty much at capacity room-wise at the Russell, but we still have some, you know, some seat availability. You, you do. You have some room at the Huntington. You have some room at the Davis. Yeah, the Huntington. We really, Manhattan. the Huntington. We've kind of, we try to freeze the numbers at the Huntington. That's one of the, uh, the plans with the extended learning time. Yeah. So you know we're working. Could you possibly put, um, if if we have more students um, in the Gilmore, would that be an option? Yes. Okay, I see that. What happens now is students are registered now, they really are going to be restricted to their choices. Mm -hmm. Because the neighborhood schools for the most part are full. The emphasis will be, will be placed on filling up the Russell and the Gilmore. And the Gilmore, okay. I see that. Those numbers are better. I'm still a little concerned with um, with grade one. I still see a lot of 27s and the 28s really concern me. Um, well, the and Davis moving. School is the school that has the highest numbers. Mm -hmm. That that is one of the you know the issues there. If you look across, they have 136 students with five teachers, so they are uh, their average is probably 27. What do you attribute that to? Is it a K to eight model that parents are looking for? Or is it because of the population in that school zone? Well, it's it's pretty much the. I think it, it's many things, but the K to eight is an important piece. When you go back and you look at the kindergarten numbers in the past, which you're not going to be able to see, but the Davis School, even this year, has been able to adjust their numbers and still have the five classrooms. They've gone from 136 students in kindergarten uh, last year just about to 112 this year. Mm -hmm. So next year, as this goes forward, uh, we should see a reduction in the number of first grade students at the Davis School. Because this is just the aftermath of having the high numbers at the kindergarten level. That's true. And what happens is if you, if you decide and you pick a K-8 school, the idea is that you see something valuable in that and to stay for the nine years. And therefore, those students, they don't opt out. And you, you're not going to convince parents to make a change. That's the thing. Yeah. And so we're looking at those students being our second graders next Correct. year. Correct. And we still have five classrooms right now, but they're still going to be a little bit high. Yes. For that school. What, the, um, what really happens is if we, what we were able to do this year, we kept the numbers down for kindergarten, and that'll start you know, bearing fruit as we move through mm -hmm. the next couple of years. But your kindergarten numbers, I mean, last year, you would have looked at this, and even in grade one, you would have seen an awful lot of red because a lot of students, uh, you know, were in grade one because we had so many students in kindergarten that move, move yeah. forward. Mm -hmm. What I do want to point out is if you look at the colored squares or the, or the colored digits, those are our programs are the special education or SEI. And we, you know, at the Davis School, that's, that's, that's a concern high. there. Yeah. Uh, we've opened a couple of classrooms this year. That was part of our growth pattern. Uh, we've made some adjustments. It's now, you know, an issue of trying to keep that rolling forward, not to slide back next year, mm -hmm. and, you know, start taking back some of these classrooms, uh, having splits again, uh, just to kind of, uh, you know, to handle the numbers that we might be getting. But if you really, the difference between kindergarten this year and grade one wasn't 100 students, it's around 25. That's a, maybe that's a good trend for us because yeah we can kind of go forward with the numbers we have. Eventually you're gonna have some issues with class size, but you're gonna have issues with class size no matter what because we're a growing district. Now if you look at grade two, if you're, you're ready to do that. No, I, I have a few oh, questions. You, okay. 
I'm sorry. Um, Don't be sorry. With respect to uh, the kindergarten numbers, and actually, I guess all of these, I notice um, I'm, I'm taking it that these are individual classrooms. Correct. Each of these squares. Why, um, for example, in the Arnone, would we have two kindergarten classrooms with only 17 children and then others with the higher numbers? They would be inclusion classes, special ed. So those are okay. Yeah. Um, and, okay, yeah. Um, and then the um, the Baker School, one of our newest schools. Yes. No, well, that's pretty pretty well filled up for kindergarten. But um, going over to, well, actually, before we leave kindergarten, uh, one of the I, I got a question from a few parents um, whether have there been any issues this year with um, high enrollments and and Brockton parents. Um, well, let me ask the question this way. Are, could you let us know, could you give us a report of where the kindergarten children of, um, of non-Brockton uh, non Brockton parents are by school and classroom? I can't do that tonight, but no, I'll, I'll get okay, that for you. It's you, very, few yeah. in very few this year. Okay. You know, so, but I, we can get that for you. And then um, going to the first grade, um, the... Downey School appears to be under the 23 number. I, I'm taking it that that number nine there, that's a... That's a substantial... Sub, okay, substantially separate, okay. Um, Downey and Davis are in the same um, zone, correct? Correct. I'd be interested to see if there are any... Um, well, actually, they're not in the same, same zone. <laughs> What's we, that? We, they're not in the same zone. They're in a different zone. They're not both south zone? They're not both south. We use the Dave, the Downey School as an overflow school for, for maybe the south zone or even uh, the, well, the northeast zone, which is, was, is, is the zone that it's in. But the Downey School, uh, we've added a classroom uh, over the last couple of years. We keep growing uh, the number of regular ed classrooms in there. Uh, two years ago, I think we only had three maybe first grade. So we've added a first grade and I believe a kindergarten as well. We're starting to get that so that we'll have a, a pathway for, for a whole um, K to five strand. We're growing that school back. Uh, their enrollment, I think, is up over 650. And a few years ago, it was closer to 420. So mm -hmm. we're, we're making some pro uh, progress there. We also use that school, 22, 22, and 22. Anyone coming into the district that's probably in the z south zone wishing to go to the Davis, we're going to push that. They will not be going to Davis. They'll have to go to the Downey School or uh, one of the other schools that, that, that are in the area. The Downey is the school that we use as an overflow for the south zone. Mm -hmm. And what's what's our um, high number that we we would if we had our choice we'd want to cap that at? Well, I I, I listen. I'm sure that uh, Mrs. You know, Barry 15. would tell me 20 <laughs> is the top. <laughs> but uh, we're we're again. But realistically, I don't. We're not going to go over 25. That's our goal. You know what happened right, at the so Davis is, is unique. So you know. Two, four, six. I mean, if you look at that, you probably have room for another 40, 45 students in the district again. Yeah, I just wonder if, if we couldn't get some of those kids that are attending the Davis to. Well, I, I, mean, I, get, I have to tell you. 27 kids per classroom is just. Can give it a shot, John? Yeah, we've tried. Can you guys sharpen your pencils a well, little more? Well, it isn't us. It's, you know, we don't want to fight with parents who pick that school as, as kindergarten parents. And, yeah. you know, who goes? No, they all I, want to I, stay. I totally get that. And, I, and if so, I were a parent, I'd be saying the same thing. But 28 kids in a classroom, when we have classrooms that are, are, are fairly close, I mean, the Baker's a brand new, enormous school. And I'm, I'm not saying ship, you know, the kids that live on the bottom of Plain Street all the way over to the Baker, but is there something that, something that we could sell those parents? Um, to, to convince them because it's just 28 kids in a classroom is just crazy. Right. It just well, is. I, I, I don't disagree with you. I just, that fight has been fought. 
I, I don't doubt that not you guys much haven't success. done best. Um, uh, we we look at out of zone students. We try to, uh, you know, suggest that they go to a school in their zone. But what happens is, uh, to be honest with you, there's an appeals process. It, it can easily become politicized very quickly because, oh. you know, there could be siblings that are also out of zone. Mm -hmm. So now you're moving three or four students, and that could have an impact on a school in grade four that might have no seats available at all. Because our upper grades, our fourth and fifth grades, are going to be higher because we have fewer classrooms. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's well worth the fight. But again, I, it does come down to, you know, parents made that selection a year ago. We've more or less made that commitment. We haven't added, really, I don't believe any students to grade one from the Davis. We've just moved students forward. Oh, and does. that's the yeah. one place that, you know, they, they've stuck it out and they want to go there. So it'll, it'll get better. You know, it does get better because we yeah, right that. now have yep. 23. So yep, I saw that. that should help Thank out. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so I guess it's worth looking at it. And, and again, this is all going to change after tomorrow, correct? Well, the adjustments will be made. Um, I don't believe there's a lot of adjustments at the elementary level. I think we're pretty close. Now, for those that have been on the school committee before, I passed out the infinite campus number as well. Now, we used to have this discussion on October 1st. And you know we'd all walk out of here going, well, I, myself being one, after even giving the presentation, we might have a 300 difference between infinite campus and the actual uh, parent in, in uh, registration numbers. This year, I think it's closer to 70, maybe even 80. But those numbers we can actually adjust for. We know where they are for a change. So when we really get close, I think within two weeks we're going to be, you know, aligned perfectly. And that's that's something new because we've it's always been an issue because we would come here and talk, and you know you'd look at it and say, <laughs> why is he saying 16.4 if it's 16.6 on this list? So it is getting better. I think the reporting aspect of this is cleaning up with the with the use of technology now. That's a lot quicker. We will. We make adjustments every day for the next couple of weeks, and as we do that, these numbers will probably go down, and if the campus might go up a few. So we're still, but we're at 70, 17, 2, 15, I think, with Infinite Campus and 17.285 with this at 295. So there is hope. Uh, I think that part of it is important because when Aldo, in May, when we start to get our figures for uh, our, our Chapter 70 money, we will not probably receive money for 17,200 students. There'll be students here that have left. We haven't figured out where they are. They never came. But there'll also be probably more students in the system in the spring because after today, when students roll in, know. you know, they do not go towards the allocation formula. They're, you know, they're students that we educate. And when you look at last year's figures, I think they paid, the state paid us on 16450 which was a couple of hundred less than what we reported. Uh, but the enrollment at the end of the last year was very close to 17000 So we're getting paid for the students that did come in. They haven't left. So I think that's a that's a you know that's a positive step for us because that's going to generate more funds to provide you know more opportunities for our kids. And again, I, I feel a little more confident about that this year because uh, Aldo and his crew have done a great job, uh, really looking into the free and re reduced lunch count because the allocation formula is just that it's a formula. You get paid for more kids if they're poor kids, more kids if they need uh, SEI or special ed services. So. If we report the information correctly to the state, it should, you know, help us out in the in the spring for the following year. Now, just to show you, because I, I, as you can see, <laughs> you went from four, 1369 in grade two to 1356. We're very balanced when you when you go across that. So we should have enough room in grade two. To absorb the, the class in grade three, to absorb grade two students, uh, those numbers aren't great, but again, they're not 28 to 29. We, we've we've actually made a pretty good stand on this, and if you look at that, I, I would hope that we'd never have to go over 26. There are some seats available. We are trying to keep the numbers at the Huntington down because of the commitment that the district has made uh, it, through extended learning time. We have again probably eight seats available at the Downey School. Uh, 
And as you can see, there's only three classrooms there in grade three. We'll probably expand that to grade four if we, to four if we need be, if we can find the space. It might mean moving a, a special ed classroom out, try to get the numbers a little more balanced at the Downey. But that's where we are. The last thing I did was I, um, not that I like doing this, but when you start looking the trend over the next, for next year, we might end up getting maybe two or three classrooms freed up. And you know, they're, they're gonna be like gold to us because we're gonna need those spaces. But it, it isn't as uh, drastic as I thought it was gonna be. Uh, that Russell, uh, the opening of the Barrett School really does help you out. And it gives you an opportunity to, you know, to reduce your class size in the primary level. I didn't do anything on the grade four, grade five, because you can see that. Grade four is always interesting because we have the, the TAG program and there is usually some room in there we actually, have, I think, go from four classrooms maybe in one school to three in grade four because a lot of the students will, you know, go to the TAG program. We have that, you know, we have pretty much historical data on that. We can pretty much project where the large numbers are coming from, and that gives us some room at grade four. Um, grade four and grade five have higher numbers, but they have to get ready for what it's going to be like in the middle school and high school where the numbers are even greater. And... Uh, we, we try to provide as much service as we can to students that, in classrooms where there are, you know, a higher number than maybe they're in the counterpoint. Yes. I just have a question relative to uh, what these, uh, the numbers in these cells mean. For grade four and grade five at the Angel for the TAG program, you've got 76 and 75, but I know that there aren't that many students in one classroom. That, does that represent another? Another three classrooms. Yes, it's three classrooms. In that, in so three, in if you four. take a look at grade four, for instance, at the um, Angelo, yep. you've got three classrooms of 21. You've got one classroom for a sped inclusion of 20. You've got um, a sped classroom of five, and you've got an SEI classroom of 10. So, in addition to those, you've got three additional classrooms of grade four. I'm just trying to read it because yes. So. Well, you see the 76. Six, yes. Yeah. That's the three classrooms. They're just combined. The yeah, you're three right. 21 There's, classrooms are combined into the 76. No, 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 the 76. Right. Yeah. There are three more classrooms to, to make up that 76. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's nine grade four classrooms at that school? Could, yeah, if you count the sped, yeah. It's a lot of classrooms. Yeah, it's a large school, though. I mean, there's. And there's you know, 10 in grade five, okay. And your junior high, or I'm sorry, your middle school, some of the numbers, for instance, at north and south, you've got 42 and 47. That represents how many classrooms? See, that's the thing. We do not have the same number of clusters in each middle school. So if you look at east, uh, just as an example, they probably have four. They might only have one cluster in grades seven and eight, you know, one and seven, one and eight. So their numbers are, are gonna be a little tough. Sixth grade is tough everywhere. So you're saying it's south, uh, they probably have a cluster and a half, so six teachers. What would be the average class size, though, with those numbers? How could we well, determine that? if you take that? 161. Yeah. Right, well, I, I gotta find this in. If we take you, south. Yes, I'm looking for at south. For grade six, grade they've six got 200. It's 200. Uh -huh. They probably have six, and again, you've got to take out, uh, let's see, 56, 60 students out of that. So they have 140 students uh -huh. because those are special ed, uh, you know, special assignments. They're not regular classrooms. So you would take the difference, which would be 140, and divide that by six. So it's about 25 students in okay. a class. So you just have a different configuration. Yes. Yeah. I mean, okay. what we did a few years ago, when we did the... Uh, reconfiguration basically middle schools we had a lot more students and a lot more teachers because we hadn't expanded the growth at the Plouffe or at the Ashfield mm -hmm. now three years ago we made cuts at the middle school level as far as the number of teachers right. because we didn't need the teachers there as much as we needed the teachers I don't mean that that way but the numbers didn't justify yeah. having the numbers at the middle school when we said such high numbers at the elementary. Right, yeah. So every, that. with the exception of West, we made cuts from uh, maybe two full clusters, clusters to one and a half. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, John. That's a good point. Thank you.
When you look at uh, any other questions for John, or you know, in looking at the figures, you know, in the past two years, we have uh, this year added at this point an additional 500 students, and last year really just short of that 463. So I, I think you can see the trend. We've obviously. Uh, you've done an excellent job uh, taking a look at class size, uh, as John said, opening the Barrett Russell uh, and, and thinking about the timeline and how we got that up and going. I hope you've had an opportunity to, to get over and see our kindergarten center. I actually talked about it tonight at the West Middle School PAC meeting and you know, talked about how terrific it is to be able to have all your activities, all your focus on our kindergarten students there. Um, so we'll again continue to take a look at the numbers and we'll continue to report to you. There also will be a report uh, from the Parent Information Center on uh, our registration process this past year, some of the difficulties we encounter, and we'll be able to take a look at uh, opportunities to improve that process for our parents, our families, uh, and our staff. So any other questions on that? Okay, uh, next we have the release of the MCAS uh, 2013 uh, results. Uh, they were released uh, just over a week ago. Um, I am going to have uh, Dr. Ethan Cancel uh, come before the school committee at our next school committee meeting, I believe it's October 15th, to do a lengthy uh, presentation for you. Uh, you can ask questions, we'll be able to show you uh, the highlights, uh, some of our concerns, uh, some of our plans moving forward. Uh, we're just actually starting to digest all of the information as our, uh, our principals and our school leadership teams. Uh, just to talk about a couple of uh, highlights we had. First of all, we have remained a level three school district, really one of the only urban school districts not to be named a level four. I'm saying that uh, also uh, with some caution. Uh, we do have uh, a number of schools. You know that during the past couple of years, we have paid a particular focus to East Middle School, uh, the Huntington School, and we've seen some, some steady gains at those schools. That has paid off for you. One of the things I did yesterday uh, with Dr. Cancel is in looking at East's redesign and the Huntington's extended learning time, part of their, their grant um, requirements are that they meet with the superintendent at least twice a month to look at the initiatives, to, to look at the progress. So that is something we will continue to honor this year and at the same time, as I said, take a look throughout the district and look at those schools where we also need to pay particular focus and that we will speak to you about going forward. Uh, and looking again at a couple of the highlights, uh, Angelo School, North and West Middle School, Pluff Academy, all categorized as level two schools, which you know are the second highest level in the state's accountability system. Um, East Middle School and the Huntington Elementary School saw impressive gains. Um, and our known school showed dramatic gains worthy of high praise, uh, especially at grade four. So we will be sharing more of this data for you uh, going forward. And uh, my last report is on the superintendent's transition team report. You've heard me speaking about this. I'm happy to tell you that on September 19th, we act, were able to bring all of our transition team members together. And when I say that, I'm talking about members, when we talk about external stakeholders, we're talking about members of the business community. We're talking about representation from all of our area colleges, college presidents or their designees. We're talking about members from business. I had mentioned Bernardi, Harbor One, uh, the Chamber of Commerce with Chris Cooney came together with our leaders, uh, our internal leaders, and uh, our principals, uh, staff members, teachers, and what they're doing presently is they're setting up meetings, and they're gonna be meeting with our internal stakeholders, our teachers, our union representatives, custodians, paraprofessionals, teachers, um, to actually start to talk about the things that we wanna have dialogue for, honest, open, transparent dialogue about where we're going from here as we start 
to look at a strategic plan for the next three to five years. I will also be out starting on Wednesdays in October in each of your middle schools. And I will be meeting with parents, people in the community to start to have dialogue with them about what they would like to see retained. What are some of the changes? What are the, some of the, the positive things in our school system that they want to have retained? So again, I will be out there uh, with Jocelyn Meek. I believe this is going to be on cable. For those people that are unable to attend the forums, they'll have an opportunity to hear the dialogue in ways that they can also be represented. As you heard me say at the last uh, meeting, uh, that we also have been selected uh, to have a district review by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education at this time. So what that is, is bringing all of this information together uh, January into February, and we will be able to report to you a strategic plan that we as a district uh, will put together uh, going forward. Um, I believe that's it on the superintendent transition team. Any questions about that? Uh, the next item is um, the time at which uh, there are any school committee members or if the superintendent has any items that they would like referred to subcommittee for discussion. So I would entertain right now any requests or motions. Mr. Minicello. I we were talking about um, scheduling a curriculum subcommittee meeting and um, with all the members here. I was just wondering if next Tuesday would work well. I looked at the schedule with respect to upcoming negotiations, and it doesn't look like there's anything. Um, so I'm talking about the 8th, Tuesday, September 8th, uh, October 8th. Is that? Because the, if we tried to have it before the next school committee meeting, we have at 6.30 a photo session. So. That's not going to work, I don't think. Unless a half an hour, I don't think a half an hour is going to be adequate. So, um, does the eighth look good for people? What time would people like? What time works for people? Seven, six thirty. How about six thirty? No. Seven o'clock better for people. Okay, seven o'clock if that's okay. Okay, seven o'clock for curriculum sub. I'll find out from Wanda what's available and then we'll notify everyone. Okay, thank yep, thank you. Any other requests, concerns, questions? Seeing none, the next item that um, on the agenda is uh, under unfinished business and that's the approval of the community school uh, board five-year strategic plan. As you may recall, in August there was a presentation at which time I think we were all presented a PowerPoint presentation and I think we were actually given a copy of it as well. So um, at that that evening we never um, we never took a vote of approval on the plan. So at this time I would entertain a motion or you know, Mr. Mitchell. Motion to approve the five year strategic plan as presented at the August thirteenth regular school committee meeting. Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Uh, next item on the agenda is new business. Entertain any new business at this time. Mr. Sullivan. Just one item. Yeah. The, uh, the contract between the first students and the drivers, has that been resolved? Are they still talking? Or? I, I believe the negotiations uh, are continuing. Um, you know, we're in uh, contact with Mr. Quinlan, uh, representing for a student, you know, as needed at this point. We were very pleased that, uh, you know, our buses uh, continue to so-called roll and the children got to school safely. And uh, as many of you know, we have contingency plans in place for at any point in time if we ever needed to get 9,000 children uh, to school. Um, so we thank everybody for working uh, uh, with us and the parents for being patient. And we uh, have every hope that they will continue to bargain in, in good faith and hopefully settle this very soon, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you. Any other items in new business? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Motion adjourned. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Opposed, so move. Thank you all.